have a very nice evening to us here tonight. This is the ninth, I'm sorry, the sixth annual Judges Night of the Armenian Bar Association. Of course, we thank all of you for coming here on a Thursday night, especially our judicial officers. This is their evening, this is what they're, they're celebrating. Of course, the uh, public service they provide to all of us. Their dedication to the community, the integrity they bring to the bench, and of course the, uh, the sacrifice and how in every day of their lives they make decisions that impact other people's lives. And so we as lawyers, obviously, and others truly appreciate the work that they put in and the dedication they have to the Los Angeles and greater Los Angeles area, including Orange County. Thank you very much. Very nice evening put together. We have a, first we're going to start with a video presentation. It's going to be about three minutes long. It's going to be a little uh, sample into what the Armenian Bar Association is about. That was put together by the Garabedian Boys, by Vasha Garabedian. Yeah. And they got it together in a week's time, so we really appreciate it. Then we're going to have some great presenters that are going to come up here to uh, talk about others and give them their honorary awards for the evening. The first one will be Garo Martirosian. I will introduce him specifically or once we get to that. The second will be Brian Kabatak. The third will be Garo Azarian. And the fourth will be the Honorable Samantha Jesny. We are uh, trying to get the event finished by 9, 9.15 latest. We know it's a Thursday night, and uh, we know the judicial officers have to be on the bench by 8.30. Or more likely, us lawyers have to be there by 8.30. But... <laughs> 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 so we appreciate it. And we've also asked the presenters to keep their remarks brief so we can hopefully stay on track. So thank you very much. Was the 2000 Consumer Attorneys of Los Angeles Trial Order of the Year? Yeah. 2010 Consumer Attorneys of Los Angeles President. He has dedicated himself since he started practicing law in 1981 to representing others who sometimes don't have access to justice. He has established himself as a pillar in the community. And I've had the opportunity to work with in the last 20 years, and there have been times that it's been interesting. So, Garo, please come on up here. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. There's so many friends, so many great people. I'm just so excited about what tonight. This organization has uh, started back in '89, and look at where it is now. Uh, we've had some difficulties, but we're flourishing. About the Beacon Simonian Scholarship Fund. Beacon Simonian was a pillar of this community. His family immigrated to America from the Middle East, as did mine. His father operated and owned a mobile gas station over there on Bronson and Sunset near La Country High, and my father had a gas station on Fairfax and Open across from Kansas. Same mobile gas station, same brand, and they were friends. His father, Grant, my dad's killer. I went to Hollywood High, what we can. We were both sheets. Then we also went to UCLA, we attended UCLA together. Beacon was an amazing man. He had this enthusiasm that was contagious. He had a heart of gold, the friendliest guy in the world, smart. In academics, he was great, but he was even greater in athletics. Here's a guy, maybe 5'10", Armenian, who knew Armenians could run fast, but this guy <laughs> could run. He ran the mile in 4 minutes and 9 seconds. He was a track athlete and star at UCLA. He held six different records at UCLA. He ran the marathon in 2 hours and 18 minutes. 
Think about that. A lot of you guys are thinking, I did a marathon in six hours. I did it for four. Two hours and 18 minutes. That's five minute per mile clip for 26 miles. He did that. But he was a guy that gave. He gave me the opportunity to have any time anybody asked him anything, he'd give. My daughter, Ani, decided to uh, run. He, she also was track and field. And he can't find out about it. He came, watched her run, he gave her it. And then he met with us and gave her all sorts of advice, coached her, and we very much appreciated that. This was a guy with a heart of gold. Everybody that knew him, loved him. Unfortunately, with some of the best people in the world, things happen that should not happen. As they say, bad things happen to good people. Back in 2010, he was stricken with care of disease. And then by 2014, we lost, he fought. He fought as hard as he could. But that disease was just not one that he could beat. But he tried hard. His life partner, Jacqueline Pelez, is here tonight. She was with him for 27 years through thick and thin. She cared for him. She loved him. She was with him until the very end. With this night, what we want to do was to keep his name and his memory in the forefront. And we'll probably have other events talking about me this morning. I just wanted you folks to know a little bit about him, but more about him later. Thank you very much for allowing me to share this brief moment with you about him. Thank you. Thank you, Garo. I'm next going to invite to the stage Brian Cavatag. I'm sure most of you know Brian Kapitak. He's the president of the Los Angeles County Bar Association. He's the past president of the Consumer Attorneys of California. He's the chairman of the board of directors of Hololeo Law School. He's been a longtime friend, colleague, and somebody who's always opened his offices in other locations for Armenian bar events. He has numerous record class action settlements, including the nine figures. And he's even, he was the co-lead counsel on the Armenian genocide cases, which had the longest resolution, 90 years from the date of the incident to resolution. And of course, we have to add, don't be fooled by his name, he is Armenian. So uh, I, I'm certainly honored to be here tonight um, as a lawyer, as a member of the Armenian community, as the president of the Los Angeles County Bar, which dedicates itself to inclusion and making sure that there's a big tent for everybody uh, in the Los Angeles legal community. But I'm also here tonight as somebody who worked very hard on the um, Armenian genocide cases and am uh, completely honored to be giving this award tonight. So. Um, when I am on my way to give the award, I want to tell you, though, that I have come to appreciate the hard work that the judges do and the dedication that all of our judges do, particularly Judge Snyder, and the incredible dedication that those of you who are bench officers have made in your personal careers and the sacrifices you've made. And it, it, I see it in the, the county bar and the work we do and the interaction I have with bench officers and just the point of personal privilege, though, being up here. Um, I think that we need to work harder to get more Armenians appointed to the bench, both the federal and the state court bench. And we need to do everything possible. So let's try to make that happen. So uh, certainly the greatest honor in, in, of my life, my professional life, was being able to work on the Armenian genocide cases, um, which are possibly the only cases that have brought any semblance of justice um, to the Armenian Genocide through the cases we successfully brought against both New York Life and OXA. Um, judge Snyder was the judge we were fortunate enough to be assigned to on those cases. And in handling those cases, I could talk for hours about them because certainly um, not only is it personal to me and to all of those in the room here who are Armenian, but it's also um, an incredible story and an incredible journey. So I'm not going to tell all the stories, but I'm just going to tell one tonight, which is New York Life had a forum selection clause in their policies. And the forum selection clause said that a uh, ethnic Armenian living somewhere in the Ottoman Empire before 1915 who owned one of these policies, if they wanted to dispute 
um, the policy would have to um, come to either the courts in London or in France. The policies were written in English, which would mean that an Armenian living in the Ottoman Empire before 1915, who was not allowed to own a horse, would have to somehow find their way to a rail station, find their way to Istanbul, Constantinople at the time, then book passage on the Orient Express to Paris, and if the forum selection clause was in Paris, they would have to litigate their case there, or they would have to somehow cross the channel and litigate their case in London, which means they'd have to find an Armenian-speaking solicitor to represent them. And that was New York Life's attack on the case, was the forum selection clause. And we brought that in front of Judge Snyder, and we argued that in front of her, and she saw the idiocy in enforcing a forum selection clause in that manner for someone in 1915 and allow the case to move forward and then help facilitate the resolution of those cases for nearly $40 million, much of which went to Armenian charities. And unfortunately, on our third case, her ruling was overturned, and as many of you know, um, the Ninth Circuit sitting in Bank found that um, it invaded somehow the president's power to set foreign policy by allowing cases involving the Armenian genocide to go forward. Uh, what I wanted to do though tonight was tell you um, what a great person she is. And I just briefly went online today and was finding and reading some things about her. And this is my favorite. Every judge should take lessons from the Honorable Christine Snyder. She is patient with everyone, but still has control of her courtroom, and she knows the law inside and out. And I think that is a fitting, fitting tribute for a great person who we are all honored to have here tonight in our midst and to present this award to. So please join me in congratulating and welcoming Judge Snyder. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you so much for this honor. I can't begin to tell you what it means to me. I have my mentor here tonight, different interviews in, my colleague, Jackie Trojan, and all the wonderful judges of the Los Angeles Superior Court, and I am truly honored to be here. As Brian said, um, I have no illusion. The reason I am here tonight is because of the Marushin case, and he's told you a lot about it, and uh, it was a remarkable experience for me. As all of you know who practice in federal court, uh, cases are randomly assigned, and I consider it really my great fortune to have received that case by random assignment, because it was, it was intellectually challenging, but at the end of the day, it gave me an opportunity to come to know much more about this great Armenian community than I might otherwise have known. And in preparing for tonight, I came across a law review article published in the Southwestern Journal of International Law, which recounted the journey of the Mauritian case and the other cases that Brian referred to. It was reported what you all know better than anyone else, that between 1 million and 1.5 million Armenians died between 1915 and 1920 as a result of the forcible expulsion by Turkish authorities of the entire Armenian population from eastern Anatolia into the deserts of Mesopotamia, a region now in modern day Iraq, Kuwait, and Syria. The expulsion was carried out through the most horrific means, forced marches where expelled civilians died for lack of food and water and shelter, or were killed by Turkish soldiers and police. Many were murdered, and village by village, mass killings led to additional deaths. In 1915, again, as you know better than most other people in our community, it is estimated that approximately 2.5 million Armenians were living in the Ottoman Empire. By 1923, a mere eight years later, only 200,000 remained. The children and relatives of that community and the survivors of that Holocaust came to the U.S., they came to California, 
and the Mauritian case was brought on behalf of the heirs of those who lost their lives and by their heirs who sought to recover proceeds from the insurance policies that Brian referred to. As Brian Apley said, the policies were written in English and French and plainly few people in the Ottoman Empire, be they Turkish, Armenian, or anything else, could read those languages. They did not know where they had to litigate their claims. And so, years later, uh, as a, actually following the model, and maybe doing a better job, of the uh, legislation in California and acted to help Jews who stood in similar uh, situations after the uh, Nazi years, the California statute was enacted. And I was privileged to decide in that case that the form selection clauses were not valid and that people living in California could not be required to travel uh, to Europe to litigate claims. The idea was preposterous, and notwithstanding having been presented with mounds of scholarly declarations by people who taught law in England and France and everywhere else saying that the European forms were fair and convenient, uh, common sense prevailed, and I knew that I had to make, at that time when I was young and a little frightened, one of the more courageous decisions that I had to make. But much more important than what I did in the case is the opportunity that I had to learn about the Armenian community, your culture, what you have achieved, and I learned of the rich culture and heritage of the Armenian people in the course of the settlement of Mauritian because I supervised the charities and worked with the lawyers in determining where the monies would go. And for me, uh, learning about the Armenian people, the ranching disaster and that diaspora that all of you and your heirs, or I should say, uh, relatives endured was really not unlike the experience of my own Jewish community. The parallels in our community's histories are striking and sobering, and we all bear special responsibility not to forget these horrific events and to prevent their repetition. One chilling utterance I learned in the course of preparation uh, for tonight was that Adolf Hitler in August 1939, made the following point to his generals. He assured them that they would enjoy impunity for prosecution for the unprovoked attack on Poland, since, as he said, quote, who after all speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? The law I was called upon to adjudicate was designed to permit errors of victims to be compensated for injustices endured by their ancestors. And while that law was later held to be invalid, as indicated earlier tonight, the pursuit of justice must never end. So I accept this award knowing that in large measure it is given to honor the memory of those who died not so long ago and to mark one episode in an effort to provide justice for descendants of the Armenian people. So I thank you, and let me again stand extremely honored to recognize you. States District Court Judge Christina A. Snyder, Lady Justice herself, for ensuring that the scales are balanced with the demands for those for whom redress has been long denied for condensing the legal entreaties of the Armenian people through your courtroom door, giving breath to the dignity of the mere mission, for at once exhibiting and internalizing your understanding of an ancient civilization's contemporary struggle for reconstitution and restoration, and for ennobling the hallowed halls of justice with your grace, eloquence, and example. November 8th, 2018, Glendale, California. Congratulations.